Good morning to everyone this morning that is uh, joining us uh, via the live stream and happy Thanksgiving to you and your families near and far. Might be a different uh, Thanksgiving celebration with with family members being away and not being able to uh, to be close to us, but uh, be sure and reach out to them, of course, uh, in all the other ways that we can without physically being with them. So uh, let me join us together uh, in the scripture readings this morning. The first comes from Genesis chapter 4, and I'm reading verses 1 to 12. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And also Abel brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not, did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face so downcast? If you do what is right, will it not be accepted? But if you don't do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. You must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let us go out to the field. While they were there in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Oh, I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops over you. You will be a reckless wanderer, wandering the earth. In Matthew chapter 6, I'm reading some selected verses, the first four verses, and then verses 19 to 23. Jesus says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, so that they are honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And in verses 19 to 23 from the same chapter, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye, of the lamp, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Let's give thanks to God for his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, how you teach us and instruct us. And we pray, Lord, your, your blessing upon the message this morning, that you would write it upon our hearts through your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is Thanksgiving weekend, I know. And I do have a Thanksgiving message, all right. But the scripture readings, of course, may have thrown you off a bit, especially the the one from the Old Testament book of Genesis. I just read of the birth of the first sons of the earth and what happened is, as they had become adults, we witnessed the first murder. The names of the first boys were Cain and Abel. Now you know how a, a name is often given a meaning or there's a meaning behind a person's name. Well, the Hebrew language, of course, did the same kind of thing. And it's interesting to learn that what Cain and Abel's names actually mean. For Cain, 
the one who murders his brother. His name means to gather or to possess. And Abel's name, it means breath or life. Right from the beginning of humanity's existence, the first sons give us a choice of paths to take in life. We can either gather and collect, we can amass stuff, or we can be controlled by that or choose life. Now you can say we can have it both ways and there's certainly an argument for that. But if you're talking about this life, this short period of time in which we, we live these mortal lives, but the word of God teaches us that there's more to life than this life. And this point, uh, this points us to the life or breath that Abel's name speaks of. And this needs to be our, in our thoughts as the real life, not the one that we're living today, but the eternal life to come. So in chapter four of Genesis, we have Cain who got offended and God showed some favor to Abel's sacrifice. Cain turns around and he murders his own brother. Now, prior to this, God warns Cain. He sees Cain's discontentment. Cain has lots of stuff, but because he doesn't have all that he wanted, and as far as we know, the thing that he didn't have was he didn't have this favor from God that, that his brother had. So he decides to go his own way, and he kills his brother. God had warned Cain about his anger, his emotions. God could see it. And he says, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Maybe in today's day and age, it's like you have everything you need. Why the discontentment? If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? The Lord tells Cain that sin is, a, is crouching at his door. It wants to have him. And God told him he, he must overrule it. This sin of Cain is what he wanted that he didn't possess. He wanted the favor of God that his brother had received and wanting something that someone else has, well, that's coveting. It's the 10th commandment. And it's our breaking of this 10th commandment that has us breaking all the rest of them. We will lie and we will steal, we will cheat, we will hurt others so we can get what we want. So if we consider this in our day and age, I'm not suggesting that there's anything wrong with having stuff. We need a certain amount of stuff to sustain our daily lives, that we know. But for most of us, has all of this acquiring of possessions have us being more grateful to God? No one would agree with that. Do we not become more focused on stuff and we end up leaving God in the shadows of our hearts and minds? As soon as we have uh, lost the real focus of life, by our gathering, obtaining more and more, do we not end up causing many others to go without the basics of needs? We took a, take a look around our communities and farther out into the world, especially in places on earth where there is no extras and life is pretty much confined to seeking out enough food for the day. There's billions of people on the planet today that survive on less than $300 a year. Yes, many are starving to death, but they're not dying of stress-related illnesses or worrying over the stock market or retirement plans. Billions are not consumed by having the best and the newest stuff that the world has to offer. But in our ungrateful state, we continue to amass more and more for ourselves, and by doing that, we let others go without. Some of those who struggle are they're only a stone throw away while we continue to turn a blind eye to this. And we kind of rationalize this situation, something like what Cain did. Once Cain was busted for the murder of his brother and God questions him on it, Cain replies with the same kind of attitude that we may exhibit concerning the life or death of others. Because God asked him, he says, where is your brother? Cain says, I don't know. Am I his keeper? Am I his keeper? So for us as believers, do you not think that the blood of the innocent, the lives lost to our greed and the lives of more than plenty, will not their death scream out to the Lord? Why haven't they helped? Why do they not help us? So what happened to Cain? He was put under a curse. 
the scriptures tell us. It says that he would be a restless wanderer on the earth. And here we are living in the western part of the world, the land of plenty. And most of us, we live very well. We may not have all that we want, but we certainly, for the most part, we have more than we need. And I feel that the more that we have, the more that we want. It's like we're under the same curse, being a restless wanderer, always unsatisfied with what we have, and we're always searching for more and more. Now, this message isn't a dig against the rich. There's nothing wrong with wealth. People often misquote the scriptures all the time when they say that money is the root of all evil. But that's not how the scripture teaches it, because it says the love of money will cause all that evil. I know many people who are very well off, and I've seen a number of times where they've used it for the good of others. They spread it around. But most, if not all of us, need to learn that how we can get by on less. Even though we may not have huge bank accounts, if we all shared a little of what we have, everyone would have what is needed. We are all reminded often about what's really important in life. It's not money or possessions. Ask a dying person if money is important to them. I knew a millionaire when I asked him what all his wealth meant to him once he knew that life was short. His reply that money didn't mean a thing. The recent COVID crisis should have taught us that money isn't the most important thing. Love and family and friends the blessings of being able to be with people that we love, these things are important. We're reminded all the time that life is short and we can't take our stuff with us. All of our prized and new shiny things, they can't go with us. We're gonna have to leave that to someone else to fight over. So we're forever ungrateful for much of what we have and we have this unquenchable thirst for more. I hate to break it to you, you know this, but we ignore this. But our purpose in life is not to enjoy all that we've worked hard for. Our purpose is to love God and to love others. There's a testing of sorts coming our way. Some can see a financial crisis deepening in the future. Many economists say that it's coming. Many will fall on harder times. Some will end up losing some or all of their possessions they have. Some are losing their homes as I speak. They're now homeless. Maybe some of you aren't aware of this. And why? Maybe you feel a bit like Cain. You're not their keeper. You're not responsible for them. I read this past week that there's a real risk coming in the new, you know, within the year that up to 20% of mortgage Mortgages will default. If this message resonates with you, if it somehow through the spirit of God encourages you to be more grateful for the abundance that you have, and this has you being more giving to those who have less, then that's great. But in giving more to others, be careful not to be the type that gives and needs to have it announced all that you have done. Give quietly and expect no reward or recognition. If someone knows that you've helped, you have no control over that. But give and give willingly and quietly. The New Testament reading from Matthew this morning has Jesus instructing us on the matter. He says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others. In this case, we're talking about our acts of generosity. Jesus says, if you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And he continues, he says, when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets. You don't have to tell everybody. Everybody doesn't need to know what you've done. Because if you do that, you'll have had your reward. Jesus says, when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, do this in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And it's not always possible, I know, to help others in secret. Okay, so the help was given. That's the important thing. But as far as it is possible with you, do the help without all the fanfare. 
If we allow ourselves to be consumed by wanting more and never, never really being satisfied, we're more than likely going to live our lives with less gratitude. We're going to get angry and we're going to get depressed when something goes wrong with our stuff and it gets broken or it needs replacement. Or now it just needs to be replaced with a newer version because we're not happy until we update. When putting this message together, I was thinking of last October 2019 and I was on a little pity pot there for a while because everything that Nikki and I had that had a gas or a diesel engine wasn't wasn't working. The more stuff I have, there's more stuff that's going to break down. We're consumed by this life. And many, if not most, are not thinking of the life to come. Some don't even consider God, heaven, and the hot place in the south. And maybe this is one reason why some still choose not to come to faith. Because somehow it's going to cost them financially if they decide to follow God. The thinking might be like, I know God will want me to be more giving to others. And that means I'm going to have less for me. I'm not reading the minds of people. But this is the kind of thoughts that go through many of the minds. We have to fight against our own greed. To be more thankful for the real important things. And first and foremost, seek God and his salvation that he gives through the living, risen Jesus Christ. This above all else is all that we really need. All we really need in this life is to find eternal life through Christ. Later in the chapter that I shared from Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Because all these things will disappear. They can be stolen. They can rust out. But he says to store up for ourselves things in heaven. It can't be stolen. It won't wear out. It's eternal. He says, for where your treasure is, that's where your heart also resides. Where are our treasures? Are they here on earth or are they stored for us in heaven? Our Christian hearts and lives, our devotion to God is revealed to God in the world in many ways. One way is our being willing to part with some of our hard earned resources. These are used to help the needy around us in other parts of the world as well. People belong to churches yet never support the church. Poor people in the church often give more of a percentage of their income than those who give more out of the larger and more abundance that they have. It's no point in gathering or amassing more stuff that we really don't need other than to show how well off we are. We can get by with less so that others have a bit more of the basics. When we give help to others, we're storing up treasure in heaven. No stock market crash or economic downturn is going to damage our heavenly investment. And Jesus goes on to say that no one can serve two masters. You'll hate one or love the other. You cannot serve God and money. If money and the stuff that we have is first place in our lives, especially when we have more than we need and the extra that could be used to help of the lives of others just to survive. If this is what's in control of our lives, then we're living like Cain, the first murderer, the one whose name means to acquire or possess. I don't know who gives what in our local churches, but I sense that there are some who have very little. They're the ones that devote to their offerings. What would churches or other uh, charitable entities look like? What would they look like in that work that they do to serve others and help others? What would they look like or how would they be better able to help others if they didn't need to struggle so much with their own finances? If people who had more than enough in those same communities parted with some of what they had, we could have a safer and healthier and more grateful souls in our communities. 
Are we truly thankful to God for all that he's done? If we take money out of the conversation, are we in deep enough with God to be aware, even slightly aware of how good we have it? Now, to be honest, I wouldn't want to be homeless. I wouldn't want to be starving, but I would hope that I would choose to be homeless or starving if it meant me having my eternal life lost. Do we consider, do we consider Jesus Christ and what Jesus has already come to pay for our sins so that we can have life, that eternal life in heaven to look forward to? Because no matter how little we have, if we're thankful to God for what he has given us through Jesus Christ, then we are rich. Money won't buy us eternal life. There's no price that can pay for our entrance to heaven, not in monetary value. This is Thanksgiving weekend. And we're likely to say, as we have already had, happy Thanksgiving to someone and they'll wish us the same. But I've always marveled, and I know many of you do too, the strains that we need a day of the year to remind us to be thankful. I know many who listen today and many more, they struggle with all kinds of burdens. The loss of loved ones or unemployment or what used to be a sort of financial stability. But if we lose all that we possess, if we lose all that we hold dear to, yet if we still have had focused on Christ and the eternal life to come, it can help us. It can help you bear the losses of today because there is more life to come. Being thankful for not having all that somebody else has, it can be argued that the kind of thinking is not really being thankful. How many times, oh, my life's not so bad, there's lots else worse than me. Is that truly being thankful? It may be true that we can give thanks for not having someone else's trouble. But truly being thankful for what you don't have is as bad as someone else. You will have them helping those who have it tougher than you. Let me rewind that because I think I got that mixed up. Truly being thankful that you don't have it as bad as someone else will have you helping those who have it tougher than you. So if you're in the mindset that stress or worry, all these things over your stuff, maybe, maybe you have too much stuff. Start thinking about the blessings, the countless blessings that you have. Don't count all the material stuff because that stuff doesn't last. That stuff can be taken, it can be lost or destroyed. What is it that you possess is guaranteed to last forever? It's the salvation of your very soul. So as we consider Thanksgiving, let us remind ourselves that Jesus has given us already all that we need. The saving of our souls. If you haven't accepted Jesus' gift of salvation, then no, no matter how rich or well off you may be. As Jesus would say, you are poor, blind and wretched. The most needy person in existence if you don't have his salvation if you haven't accepted jesus you are close to homelessness or worse then accepting jesus makes you an investor in the eternal life and you're richer than you think i know i've spoken a lot about money in this message and we can be thankful for finances as we need money in this western part of the world especially to, to exist to, to navigate but being truly thankful doesn't require a single penny we have much to be thankful for that doesn't have a monetary price tag on it so count your blessings see what god has done for you list them say them out loud i thank god for this for that the best thanksgiving can only be when stuff is not the priority and that we can become most grateful for the eternal treasures that await us let us pray heavenly father we thank you lord for the day that you've given us 
often we take each day for granted. Lord, as we observe Thanksgiving, help us, Lord, to not only focus on being thankful this one day a year, but that your spirit will remind us to be thankful for the many, many things that are in our lives that, that matter, family and friends, above all else, so our relationship with you, that we take that lightly at times. We're not always focusing on what you have done for us in the past that secures our future. So help us, Lord. Help us to be thankful for you creating us and saving us through Jesus Christ. And that you help us daily through your spirit. Lord, we ask that you be with those you use to provide us with our, our daily needs. We pray protection upon them. We pray, Lord, that for all those who travel this weekend, that you'll grant a journey's mercy to them to bring them to and fro their destination safely. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Happy Thanksgiving to each and every one, and blessings upon your week. And don't forget to wash your hands.